Welcome to the January 29th uh, Financial Insights and Shomriya Aretz uh, webinar. I'm Richard Gray. I've been associated with the Financial Insights webinar quite a bit and actually was involved with Shomriya Aretz many years ago. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. Please consider sharing some of your savings from tonight with FJMC. We're always looking for new speakers and topics. So if this sparks any ideas with you, please uh, send them to Gary and me. Uh, I, I've put a, a, a link in the chat for the slide set for tonight. It's a tiny URL, it's a short link. You can just copy that. And uh, it, you may find it helpful as we're going along or else uh, you can just copy it down for future reference. Uh, Please put your questions into the chat and uh, we will, Gary and I will pose them either during this, during the presentations if necessary, but most likely right afterwards. Uh, and then we'll be going, as we go along, we'll get more relaxed and people can speak up more directly. Uh, please welcome our presenters, uh, Scott Kadish, Len Whitman and Gary Smith. Now I'd like to invite uh, Gary to introduce our main presenters. Gary Smith. Welcome, everybody. It's a good time to have this in January, <laughs> unless you're down in Florida, which I hear is pretty cold right now. But anyhow, I want to welcome Scott cold. and Len. We're very excited to have them address this topic. I think it's uh, affecting all of us way more than we uh, want to let on to believe. Um, they're going to address clean energy and the tax advantage energy to power our homes, our cars, and our synagogues, something we're all attached to. They will chat about 35 minutes or so, and we'll leave about 25 minutes for questions. Further, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat, as Richard said, and uh, we will address them. Uh Richard will have everyone on mute, and if you have a question that you need to ask, like right now, then then um, uh, raise your virtual hand. Uh, Scott is a member of the FJMC in the New England region. He leads the Shamarayas program of FJMC. He's very passionate about providing education and helping us take care of the environment. He has been a financial advisor, financial planner, a tax professional with vast experience educating about tax advantages uh, and adding clean energy to our homes, etc. Len lives in Marlboro, New Jersey with his family. He's very active at the JCC and on his board and was a past men's club and synagogue president. Len's a CPA with a specialty in small businesses and has done significant amount of clean energy in the clean energy space. And with that quick uh, introduction, Len and Scott, welcome. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us. The FJMC is an umbrella organization around 200 men's groups, serving more than 20,000 men, primarily throughout North America and Canada. The mission of FJMC is to involve Jewish men in Jewish life. Shomer Haaretz is one of the affinity groups through FJMC, and one of our, our objectives has been and will be to continue to help synagogue members provide programming and educational resources to help members become more engaged in environmental acts of tikkun olam or improving the world. Some of our programs in the past have included picking food from a local farm and donating to families in need, creating a synagogue-wide recycling program and installing rooftop solar panels. And more information, as you can see in this slide, uh, is available at uh, the link right here. So I will turn it back over to Len. Um, all right, so just a quick, uh, you know, we, we've we introduced Scott and myself, um, but just a quick disclaimer at the very head, it's here in the deck. Um, this is just for our discussion purposes tonight. I'm not attempting to become your accountant or give you tax advice. These things are complicated and everyone's situation is different. You should consult with your own tax advisor before doing anything that we talk about tonight. So what is the Inflation Reduction Act? So Scott 
approached me when we, you know, we had a meeting um, with the Shomri Haaretz, and he said, hey, maybe we should do something on um, the IRA. And I, being an accountant, I was like, well, I don't know what an individual retirement account has got to do with Shomri Haaretz, but if you want to do that, we can. But then he he made it clear to me that he wasn't talking about in, individual retirement accounts, that he was talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, which is, in fact, um, a new a law that was signed uh, last summer, August 22. Um, it does not have a lot to do with inflation, um, but what it does have is it has new and expands previous credits related to uh, clean energy fields. And there are two main parts of this uh, act uh, that affect, one could say broadly, business and personal. Um, and tonight we're basically going to be talking about the personal side of things. So uh, for individuals on the personal side of thing, you can have energy efficient home improvements. And what these are basically talking about are the envelope of your home. This is about insulation, windows, doors, things like that. Um, and also the, the source of heating or cooling for your home. The old rule was, the previous rule before the new law, you, were, you could take a credit up to $500 of 10% of the cost of your improvements. However, there was a lifetime limit of $500. So most people, if you replaced your air conditioner or your furnace or something like that, or all the windows in your home, you would consume all of the credit. However, the new rule under the new act it gives you a 30% credit on improvements, and it also um, limits it now at $1,200 per year. And the lifetime limit has been removed. It is now an annual limit. So you could do projects, uh, space them out over years, and take $1,200 year after year. And it also added a new item, and that is a 30% credit on the cost of energy audits, where you pay a professional to come to your home and determine what improvements would be most efficient for you. There are sublimits under this rule for certain properties. Um, there's a $600 credit limit on windows and skylights. And there's also a $500 a year limit on doors. And that's $250 per door, a limit of two doors per year. And I know some of you are asking, but wait, I thought I could get more than $1,200 a year under this new rule. And you can. You can actually get $3,200 a year under this rule. However, the $1,200, as we discussed, was for like insulation, windows, doors, um, air conditioners, things like that. However, if you install new kinds of a newer, you know, the, the new cleaner technology of heat pumps for either heating air or water, or also biomass stoves and biomass boilers, um, you can get $2,000 per year based on the 30% credit of those things. So those are, you know, sort of uh, improvements to your home. There's also new credits available for actual energy producing property. So for example, photovoltaic solar electric, uh, solar hot water heaters, uh, fuel cell, small wind generators, and also battery storage, all these types of properties now are available for a 30% credit. The old rule started out at 30% and then was declining down by 2% over a number of years. So property between 2020 and 2022 was 26%, and then it was scheduled to go down to 22%. Um, but the new rule has pushed the credit back up to 30% and extended it until 2032. And there's a nice uh, publication or slide there from the government at that web address that you could go check it out if you're if you're interested in more details. And then also, again, on the personal side of this of the, of the new of the new act is vehicle credits. So the old rule, was there was a $7,500 limit uh, based on the cost of the car, but it was limited to 200,000 cars per manufacturer. Um, so Tesla had sold their 200,000th clean vehicle in January of 2019, and no more credits, federal credits were available. And GM hit their 200,000 limit in April of 2019. 
but the new rule has eliminated the manufacturer's limit on the number of vehicles that can claim the credit. The credit is a maximum of $7,500 based on the cost of the vehicle. It, the vehicle must have a minimum seven kilowatt hour battery time. Almost any electric car will do that. This pretty much just like rules out golf carts and things like that. Um, there are complex rules on where the battery material is sourced from, um, but that's not really too much for us to worry about. The manufacturers will need to get approval from the IRS. And when they do, they'll be on this web page, has a list of the vehicles you can put in the vehicle by the year, make and model, and see if it is eligible uh, for, for these credits. There are also some limitations on obtaining these credits. Um, it, the manufacturer suggested retail, retail price for a passenger auto must be under 55000 And you can get a little bigger with a van, an SUV, or a pickup. You can get up to $80,000, but anything over that will not qualify for this credit. And you, your income, your modified AGI must be under one hundred fifty dollars for single filers or 300000 for married filing joint filers. So pretty much if you're pulling down big bucks, you're not going to be able to get this credit either. You would apply for this credit on uh, that form 8936. And if you want to, that's a link to the instructions for the form. And this credit is set to expire at the end of 2032. So you, you still have time to think about it. You don't have to rush out and get it next month. And um, the next slide is about previously owned vehicles. So I'm actually going to toss it back to Scott and let him have uh, a say about these items. One of the things that's new about the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, is you can also get a credit for a previously owned clean vehicle. Now, there are some rules that you have in order to qualify for the used vehicle, clean vehicle, in order to get the credit. It has to be a, a minimum of a plug-in and it, as well as a or and or a fuel cell, the model year has to be at least two years earlier than the calendar year in which the vehicle is sold. So we're in 2024. So if you bought it this year, it would have to be a 2022 or earlier. Has to be sold by a dealer. Can't be a private party transaction. It has to be a first transfer of a qualifying vehicle since the act, since the IRA was put into law in August 16 of 22, which actually means that technically it could have been sold before August of 22. And that, that wouldn't count. It would have to be as long as uh, it hasn't been sold after August 16th of 22, it would count for the uh, used clean vehicle. The credit is worth up to $4,000 or 30% of the purchase price. And the maximum is the sticker price or MSRP is $25,000. So there are some limitations. If you make too much money, uh, you can't claim uh, the purchase of a used uh, vehicle, clean vehicle. The threshold is 150,000 for if you're married filing jointly, uh, and 112,500 for head of household, and 75,000 for single. There's a new um, um, provision in the the IRA uh, that basically says both with new and clean vehicles. Now, when you go to the dealership you can actually get the credit right there at the dealership uh, as opposed to have to uh, wait to get the money uh, back uh, when you file your, your taxes so that, uh, you know, the dealers are getting educated and should basically have all their ducks in a row when you, when you arrive. Um, and, and that, you know, is very advantageous for, for, you know, people who don't want to wait to file their taxes to get a credit. Uh, there are a list of the vehicles that are a very extensive list of vehicles that qualify for the used uh, car clean vehicle credit. 
not only have we included some links that should be very helpful to people who want to take advantage of the clean energy credits through the Inflation Reduction Act, this link contains, I think, one of the best handouts the IRS has done in recent times. It is a quick synopsis of all the credits, how they, how you can get them. Uh, it's only two pages. And like much of the IRS uh, literature that comes out that can often be confusing and poorly worded or tricking, this I find to be uh, pleasantly easy to read. And we're gonna, we're here tonight, Len and I can answer most of the questions on that form, but, um, and, those of you should have the deck too. We wanted to make it available to you. So before we roll into the Q&A part, uh, we'll wrap up. Len and I wanted to talk a little bit about how the Inflation Reduction Act has some new provisions in it that are very beneficial for synagogues and houses of worship, just uh, for nonprofits. So uh, they're, they're, they're very large. And for those of you who are considering, you know, in your synagogue uh, to do either rooftop solar or retrofit for the next 10 years, you're gonna have ample opportunity to save potentially, if not thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. So the main differences between before the Inflation Reduction Act uh, kicked in, which is basically after, December 31st of 22, is that um, once upon a time, there were no tax credits for installing rooftop solar unless you got very creative, which Len will actually talk about uh, shortly. Um, only there was also an extremely valuable deduction uh, that was available, but only prior to taxpayers and government entities. Now it's available to synagogues, temples, and other tax-exempt organizations. Uh, prior to, uh, there were also valuable credits, but you had to reduce the power costs of your, um, of your building by 50% prior to the Inflation Reduction Act. And finally, uh, another calculation to save further save on a deduction of your, of your temple was capped at $1.88 per square foot. Come the Inflation Reduction Act, as you can see on the right side, now all nonprofits can take advantage of a 30% tax credit for installing rooftop solar. So they don't have to get creative in, in the ways that Len Synagogue did in New, New Jersey in, in the form of a direct payment. So the money comes right back as a refund, direct payment to the synagogue. Um, even though they don't, you know, they're just filing a, a tax return, they don't have, in most cases, do not have profit. And again, it's not only synagogues, it's schools, churches. Um, and what actually happens is part of the, the tax benefit comes in this form of this deduction that can be transferred to the design firm of, the, of your synagogue uh, and can basically help you negotiate you know, probably up to tens of thousand dollars, tens of thousands of dollars off the project. Um, uh, and finally, um, the energy efficiency only needs to be reduced 25% now uh, to be eligible as opposed to 50%. And you can actually get as an additional deduction when you're doing the calculation, if you get all the, the, um, the bells and whistles uh, when you're reducing, you know, doing a retrofit of your synagogue, you can get up to $5.36 per square foot. Um, like, and we'll, we're happy to talk about the individual benefits that also basically don't expire. You can use them every year over and over. With the, with the synagogue, um, there's no lifetime limitation. So every fifth year, it's like the, um, um, the, What's it called? Schmidt, uh, Shmita? Um, someone help me. Every seventh year? Yeah, that's right. The Shemitah year. Yeah. The Shemitah year. It's like that. Shmita. All over again. So this is very exciting for anyone, you know, who has a synagogue or 
even a you know a nonprofit building, you can save tremendously more by making the building more energy efficient. Uh, before I pass it back over to Len for him to tell you his, the fantastic story of how his synagogue installed a very large rooftop solar system, um, I, I want to let people know in, that anybody, again, who's interested in the uh, synagogue retrofit or rooftop solar, uh, we are going to do an additional webinar in the spring after tax season. If you but here's some things uh, that you should do uh, uh, in order to kind of, you know, between now and then get ready to, um, you know, hear our webinar about the specifics of all the savings you can get with the tax deduction and the credits, uh, the new the new credits, uh, including a, uh, a synagogue in Wayland, Massachusetts that reduced their carbon footprint by 90%. They're gonna have a webinar where the team that actually did that's going to walk around the synagogue and actually show you how they did it. So that's you can register with this link. Uh, the other uh, four bullet points were actually given to me by um, I'm part of this uh, another organization in Massachusetts called the Jewish Climate Action Network. And there's a gentleman there, uh, Fred Davis. Some of you may have heard of him. He's a volunteer, but um, he he's really uh, the, the whole idea of, of making synagogues, you know, eventually, hopefully as close to net zero as possible, no carbon footprint. He gave me this list of things to do, to keep in mind. One is to have faith that you can do this as a synagogue. Uh, you can commit to the goal. Uh, hopefully within five years, uh, he says, based on his experience is enough time. You need to have a plan. Uh, and there are so many uh, great consultants, uh, some of whom I, you know, I've actually got to know a little bit, but there's a whole world of them that are gearing up to help uh, synagogues and to, to do this and maximize the, their savings and their energy reduction. And like I said, um, we'll be offering uh, another webinar in May. So, uh, Keep that in mind. Now I am going to um, turn it back over to Len. He's going to tell you about the story of his synagogue and how they uh, made a huge rooftop solar project happen. Thanks, Scott. Um, hopefully you guys can see my screen. So I'll just say before I um, I dive into this, I just want to let you guys know um, I'm not an engineer. I'm not an electrician. I'm an accountant who happened to be on the temple board when this project was undertaken. So I know a little bit about it. I know intimately what we did. I don't um, I don't know how it works everywhere at all places. This is really uh, just about what we did. So our situation was we had a $50,000 annual electric bill between two buildings at our synagogue. And um, the idea came up that we were going to go solar we're going to put solar on the roof and eliminate our electric bill so um what we did was we put together an investor group and we raised five hundred thousand dollars um i'll tell you i'm not an attorney but this was considered a, like a private placement that fell under the blue sky laws every state has its own blue sky laws for this type of thing so but you know we had attorneys on the team and we uh we put this together um the the uh, system, the solar system, as we called it, is um, in new in our section of New Jersey with our power company is sized to be enough to power you for the year, and that's based on the prior two years electric consumption. So they don't want you becoming a power plant and competing with them. The maximum system you can build is what you're going to need, because they do something called net metering which is where the energy you produce is measured and then offset or netted against the energy you consume, which reminds me to make another point, which is we were not like off the grid and relying on our own solar power to run the air conditioner and the refrigerators. We 
um, are connected to the utility and we get we get electricity even when the, the sun is not out or at nighttime or when it rains for a week. Um, but we obviously don't generate as much electricity during those times to sell back and our bill goes up when the weather is poor or whatnot. Um, so in this deal, the investor group got back the federal credit of 30% right away. Um, and this is, again, under the old rules. This is before the IRA came out, um, when there wasn't the ability for a not-for-profit to take advantage of this because not-for-profits don't pay taxes. So they really have no way of reaping the benefit of a tax credit. Um, so the investors got back the 30% credit. So they got some of their investment back right away once the system was installed. The other benefit to the investors is that it generates these renewable energy credits based on the amount of energy we produce. We get a credit, we, you know, we get a credit for each unit of energy that we produce. And then we can sell these credits because they're clean credits. They were made in a zero emission way. And other places like the power company that burns coal in New Jersey, things like that, other people might buy these and there's a marketplace for them. And it's around $200 a credit that we sell it for. And I'm just saying that's the current market price for one. And then we get cash that way, which is distributed back to the investors. And the, the third way that the investors recoup their investment is they get depreciation on the equipment that is our equipment that is up on the roof of the temple. And so we get depreciation, accelerated depreciation, and that at this point, outstrips the uh, sales of credits. So we have net losses that become passive activity losses, which again, beyond the scope of this session tonight to talk about passive activity losses, but um, that comes back to the investors as a return of their investment to them. And then when after 15 years, we no longer make SREX as we make energy, the system still works and makes electricity, that is nettable against your electric bill. But after 15 years, there's no more SREX. So it's really kind of done. It's depreciated at that point. So at that point, we sell the system back to the synagogue for like $100. And that, uh, and that, and that wraps it up. And the, the synagogue should continue to get a very small electric bill for the next 10 years after that. The system is designed to last for 25 years. So that was what we did as a way to solve it. it there's, you know, it's almost like the whole thing has been mixed up now with the new IRA um, law that uh, not-for-profits can take direct advantage of these things through reduction of the transferring the credit back to the builders of the system, things like that. So that'll be exciting to see how those things come out. And hopefully that uh, other seminar that we have coming up in March, uh, maybe those folks will even talk about that or 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 other ways. Um, so that is our canned presentation for tonight. Thank you everyone who came out. And I will also thank, um, if you will, my fans who, who, who I see have shown up in the uh, participant list. So thank you very much. Um, Scott and I hope that you guys have something. We wanted to give you a taste of it. Um, we will have this recording available up uh, in a few weeks. Those are our emails. You can send something to Scott or you can send it to me at info uh, at my email over there. And I guess at this point, uh, we'll do we want to handle the the, ch the chat questions or? Um... Yeah, Richard, yeah I'll... And I'll, Richard and I will entertain the question. Excellent. So, uh, Gary, why don't I get started with the, a couple of questions? First, I'll do my question first. Uh, <laughs> someone, someone, someone said that use the word earned income associated with uh, taking some of these uh, deductions and such. Does the income have to be earned income or can capital gains and such income be used to cover the entire amount that you would then uh, gain advantage of on your taxes? Glenn, you want me to take this one? Sure. Yeah, all right. You can add to it. So sure. yeah, the, the, the credits, um, any kind of income that results in tax can be offset with the credits. Great. Okay. That keeps it simple. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I guess uh, non-taxable bonds cannot, bond income cannot, but that's not, cause that's not taxable. Okay. Um, uh, 
I think Barry Balick had a bunch of interesting questions. Several of them had the answer no. Uh, so working backwards a little bit, uh, Barry asked if, if efficient gas furnaces are in any way covered by this law. While you, Lem, while you were talking, I addressed that one. So, and I also put the two pager in the, the in the chat. So, but it is on the two pager, and it does qualify. But it's not, it's not the, it's just thirty percent credit up to six hundred dollars. So it's it's much less. That particular mm -hmm. kind, yeah. I mean, the government's going. You know, the more less emissions the better right you'll get a better credit but they still yeah. do you know you still get something it's better than yes it's not clean energy necessarily right, so then the next question is what about hybrid cars anything you can get on that hybrid electric or plug-in electric cars it's it's my under well plug-in you you might be able to it's it, i think a hybrid car is not going to meet the seven hour the seven kilowatt hour rule the, the battery is just going to be too small in a hybrid. That's okay. that's my understanding. But a, so plug in, you you just have to look carefully, speak to the dealer, yeah. whatever you're buying it from, and there may be <laughs> uh, advantage there. Yeah, and okay. I'm sure any any car dealer that's that's selling cars that are eligible for the credit will be will be touting that. You know, here's so a creative... if, if if you're putting on solar panels. And you need a new roof, and you need to cut down trees. Uh, how much of that, of those an ancillary costs, can be included in the in the net cost of your of your uh, purchase? What? Well, in my my understanding of it is is that those are not that it, that perhaps in the past that they that they that those things were taken. Um, but that now they 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 are not that the IRS is being more strict about that. Those those things aren't eligible for the credit. Um, but I would think most people, um, I don't know if you would even need that. You're probably going to hit the limit on it with just the cost of the solar system anyway. What's the limit? Uh, the so the solar system. Yeah. Yeah. For 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 what what kind of solar rooftop? Yeah. Yeah. There's there's no limit on there's no limit. It's thirty percent for rooftop. You're right. But but that that does no longer includes roof getting a new roof, which was necessary, or taking down trees, which increased the efficiency. You, you know what, uh, Marty Pale, are you on this call? He was. He is. I see him. I am. Marty. Marty's uh for those of you who don't haven't met Marty, Marty um actually sells solar systems. So what's your take on this, Marty? We are actually saying that you couldn't get uh the uh, array to run correctly unless you had good access from the sun. So taking down trees would be included and also a roof would be too, because you can't put good panels on a bad roof. So that's a it's a great it's almost like a tour discussion because it would really depend on the accountant. Some would be more conservative and say the roof may not count, but others may be willing to uh, make the argument that clearly you could make an argument to the IRS that of that. Once again, we're not we're not accountants either. Right. But we put the cost in uh, to our proposals and then we let the client the. Uh, decide with their tax professional what they're going to take as an ITC. Here's a creative question. Can I sell my EV to my wife and get a tax credit? <laughs> uh, no, I believe used, and Scott knows more about the used than I do, but I believe the used have to come from a dealer. Yeah, dealer, it's got to be a, a, a registered dealer. They, um, yep. If you okay, get, so, uh, Rob, uh, but it's very creative. <laughs> if you get a solar system and you add a battery pack to it uh, for your whole house, say, is that get does the battery pack also get the tax credit? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, I did a return last year where someone did the the battery backup, and then we did a webinar. There was a guy, uh, 
Um, Neo, who's in Jacksonville, he's FJMC. Um, if you saw that, he actually he actually talked about the battery backup. He he has it, and um, yeah, so you can definitely get thirty percent. Uh, don't want anyone to go away because we got somebody that's going to uh, just give us five minutes. Mr. Rothbard's going to give us five minutes on the hydrogen uh, coming out in the next uh, 55 years or so. Anyway, well, let me just uh, let me ask one more question. Uh, Rich Neb spends a lot of time in his pool in Florida, and he's wondering if his swimming pool heater qualifies in any way for uh, for the credit. That. I, I wouldn't be signing that return. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it has to be your residence. I don't think your pool necessarily qualifies as your residence. So, so again, on that two pager, <laughs> there is a, uh, a turn of uh, efficient heating equipment. I'm guessing you might be able to get $600 on that, but no, no big time deduction. Again, some of it is, you know, making a case if you if really if it's worth both your time and the accountant's time, because, you know, if it's anywhere on the border and not that clear, you're you're barking up a tree that may result in disallowance or more time that your accountant's spending. On so I, I guess uh, this is a little bit jumping toward what you separating out business, but can a condo association? Take advantage of any of these efficiency uh, uh, passive things as as a nonprofit does, or is that not available to a condo association? Well, uh, go ahead. No, I would say I know I don't know a lot about the the business side of the not for profit thing, but I, I would it would make sense that it would it, in as much as it's a not for profit. If if you wanted to put solar panels on your office condominium or residential, you know, homeowners association, whatever. Uh, I don't see why not. Let me just chime in that I'm doing it actually for condo association. So yes, you can. Great. Okay. Um, and what should we, uh, Martin, Marty question, what should we look for when you're, uh, or what should we avoid when you're looking for a solar system for your house? To avoid? Um, well, I mean, I, obviously the unscrupulous uh, solar installers, uh, but I think that the most important thing is to have somebody come out and do a site uh, a survey where they see where the uh, the house is uh, positioned, uh, the way of the sun, where their trees are shading it, um, uh, any other obstructions, and the amount of energy that you use that you can offset. In other words, that you can uh, you can uh, be able to produce from the panels. Aren't there some solar panels, though, that are made of lead and cadmium versus uh, less toxic materials? I, I'm, I don't know that. I'm sorry. Um, I, I know that the, the panels that, that our company uses are made in the United States, and I believe that they are under the regulations uh, from, the, from the government. So I think they may not have those toxic chemicals. I can't speak for the ones made in other places. Okay. Thank you. So... Um... I guess. Let's give a couple more questions in this area, then well, maybe we can broaden a little bit. Uh, what about community solar? How how effective is that? Uh, I don't know. My my investigations in it, it seems like it's um, there's very little going back to the homeowner. Uh, I don't know. What do you have any a sense of where community solar fits into wanting to uh, be efficient? I'm not familiar with community solar. Someone maybe who I'm, I mean, I'm familiar with it, but is there someone who knows maybe in their town or community? Yes. Um, I'm uh, from Temple of Zion in uh, River Forest, Illinois. And um, I have uh, both solar panels on my roof and community solar. Uh, the solar company that, uh, the community solar company that um, I'm using is Next Amp, and uh, actually they just opened up a second uh, corporate office in Illinois um, due to their growth. Um, 
initially when I signed up for community solar, you were able to get a, a 20% reduction in the um, in the generation of the solar racks, uh, but not the transmission because that's still handled by Commonwealth Edison. So you have to look at you know the difference. Um, so the solar panels that I have in my roof, I have like 11 panels, but it doesn't provide me enough uh, to generate all the power I need. So, I mean, I had the community solar before I got the solar panels and I'm keeping it because it will still be providing energy for me uh, since the other uh, solar panels don't completely supply the energy I need. Marty? Perhaps I could uh, give a little background to thank you, Morris. That's very good. But what the government many, many years ago was encouraging uh, private individual, private companies to go uh, produce these large solar fields that you see on the side of highways or on the top of uh, landfills. And what they do essentially is they form a club for better, lack of a better word, where you and like Morris, my, I have it also, you can join the club and the ability to use their community uh, solar uh, generation to lower your bill. So that's basically how they are. They're called community solar farms. Uh, they're terrific and uh, they're they're all over the place now because they're so popular. Great, so Brian Fern asked, uh, did you discuss PPA? Do we know what that is? Brian, maybe you want to clarify that? Sure, PPA stands for a Purchase Power Agreement. Um, and I'm very familiar with them. That's why I asked, I, I'm sorry I jumped on late. Um, PPA is a great way for a temple to actually put solar on their roof for free. Uh, because I think you were talking about investors before, the investor would be an outside investor that can take advantage of the investment tax credits, the depreciation and get the SREX. Um, the reason I'm so familiar with it, I live, I'm in Livingston, New Jersey, Temple Beshalom, we just put a 272 kilowatt system on our roof, about $800,000 system on our roof without any out-of-pockets. Um, and, and part of what I'm doing now is helping uh, temples and churches and not-for-profits learn more about how to, how to do that and why it's valuable. And we're going to save thirty dollars or $40,000 a year. The key is you have to have a good roof to put it on. So, Brian, again, you, you, you're using a broad term for a not-for-profit. Does that mean a condominium association fits into um, that? They any could anyone could possibly do it. Um, the reason why it's more incentive for not-for-profits is because there clearly is no tax return being submitted. Um, so the answer is any, even a for-profit company could actually do a PPA agreement, but typically they want to take advantage of the tax incentives and depreciation. Um, so the answer is, I would guess the answer is yes. But it's okay. a very it's a great way to skin the cat, and we're we're super happy about it. We were back to, about to spend eight hundred, get a loan for eight hundred thousand from the bank before COVID, and when COVID hit, the bank said, "Well, you're not paying your mortgage, so you can't. We're not giving you any more money." We go, "Okay, I get it." And then we 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 did the PPA route, and we're 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 very we're thrilled. I'm happy to talk to anyone about it in in, in private as well. Yeah, Brian, I'm Garrett, interested to hear this it's a story. Good. Oh, go ahead, Scott, my, please. Well, my, email, my email is in the, uh, I put it in the chat there. So um, give me a call and we can definitely set something up. Okay, Gary, did you want to expand some? On yeah, Twitter I thought we'd uh, hear uh, our buddy, Mr. Rothbart, discuss the future of hydrogen and where we're at with it and what we can look for. And if any of the things that we're thinking about, like EVs, et cetera, are going <clears> to be placed in the near future. Okay, my goal is not to discuss hydrogen, but that's okay. I am an IRA messenger trained by Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. And fortunately, Norwin Marins, uh, who is our member of Temple Beth Israel in Skokie, Illinois, gave me an opportunity to put in our Temple Bulletin an article about IRA. And I just want to give you a couple quick points how you can find out more about it. The following website is what you should use, cleanenergy.gov. 
And there's an actual book and handout that President Biden and his team have put together to explain the entire IRA and its provisions. The only thing you have to be aware of are the tax credits could be still in flux because uh, uh, the cabinet uh, secretary Yellen, so to speak, is still working with the IRS to confirm certain areas. The best thing that's happened, of course, is that the manufacturers can give you the $7,500 credit. And if you don't have any in income, so you can't get a tax credit, you can get it right there when you buy that vehicle that it qualifies. But more importantly is the idea we don't want to cut trees down because trees <laughs> take care of carbon and keep it from going into the atmosphere. But as far as someone's questions on solar roofs, uh, what I found by in Florida where I live is that the roofers are not in love so much with solar because it's very difficult on the roofs. Here in Florida, we have tile roofs. And unfortunately, sometimes that gets in the way of the solar. Probably an asphalt roof is much easier to work with. But you can store the energy, you can use it, and you can obviously on an EV uh, get a battery into your home, plug in cars, et cetera. But what I wanna bring to your attention, which is important, is that right now IRA has created more than 170,000 new clean energy jobs in its first year and is delivering progress to your families in years ahead. And it's gonna basically help mitigate what we call carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases. And that's its basic, one of its basic goals to get that down. So we meet our energy uh, rules basically 50% by 2030 and net zero by 2050 to bring down global warming and keep it at 1.5. Unfortunately, we may end up going higher than 1.5 because big oil is still driving us into oblivion. And you need to work on that definitely to get people in the Congress who are champions for the environment. So we don't end up having global warming get up to 2.6 or 2.8, which obviously is disastrous for all of us. So that's pretty much my spiel. Can we Thank get you, a, uh, can we get a hands on the number of people that have solar or are thinking of having solar in their homes in the near future? Interesting. Not, Not too, too many. many. <clears throat> we have it in Florida at a number of homes right where I live. Evelyn, okay. uh, we have about my area, which is one of these so called. Um, well, you might say a place where people live in, in under Lakewood Ranch Country Club. They have homes that have solar on them, about 20 of them around the area. Okay. As I said, the roofers though don't like them because our homes are tile roofs. So uh, Gary, uh, yeah. Gary, you had mentioned once that uh, your condominium, your homeowners association was limiting some of the, the uh, environmental things you wanted to do. Uh, have you gotten uh, in a better position for that? Or yeah, so that's why we're yeah we're thinking more of it. Homeowners associations, at least in Ohio, had a total control until the last till recently, um, and, and so they can dictate if you can use solar and and where you can put it. Uh, we can't put it at the most ideal spot, but we can put it in areas that will allow us uh, 80 to 90% of the, the effect. So we're still, we're strongly considering it at this point. Um, okay, Evelyn, great. You, Evelyn, you wanna say something? Oh, I, I was just saying worth considering solar. Our challenge is that the money we would recoup, would take a long time to recoup the money from, from it. And so that was just from one bit. So we're kind of curious what other uh, installers that are in the area. Um, and then that's something that's definitely something we would consider if we were able to get more of a sense of what the real cost is and how long it would take to recoup it. Scott, you want to answer that? Um, 
that's more of a Marty question. I, I don't, it's not really a tax question, uh, but I'd like to know. <laughs> well, so, so let, you, let me, where, let, me give some, let, let me give I, some, uh, a, a little bit of experience. Um, my impression is that seven years or so is possible in terms of getting down to zero investment. It's tough. You really have to have good sun and do things right. Your, your electric company has to give the right rebates. You probably you may or may not want to have a battery. A battery is a adds a lot of value to your system, and it should be even more value over time as people move into more electric cars and things. Uh, it's sort of neat in that a a battery as a backup as opposed to a generator, it doesn't have to be as huge as a generator because it gets recharged every day by the sun. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's uh, it just a lot of th things can work very very well. But uh, my impression is that that seven years is 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 a really aggressive target. Also, it adds a, value to your house, though, doesn't it? It does. Um, yeah. Anywhere between four and five percent, according to Zillow. Wow. Yeah, yeah but I've also I, I've also heard that people that you know, if you get a lease on on it, some people don't want it on their house, so obviously you don't look at that house. But I heard there's some difficulties with moving the credits over and stuff. So I heard there's downside uh, if you're going to move me out of your house anytime soon. So most, most though, I can tell you most times that the agreement's assumable. So, and, and generally that it's not like a swimming pool where some people don't want it and some people do, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to not want to have a uh, discounted electric. No, no. So I agree with that. They run know. the solar piping across your house and down the wall to a box. And that's how they put it in for solar. And if you don't like a lot of pipes and things running across your home, that's a problem. But they do do it this way. So you have the energy stored when you need it. And as someone indicated about building a big battery system in their home, that's also a possibility. So we're, Rich Neb had a, another good question. Now that if we blew off his... Uh, his swimming pool. Uh, I guess, uh, Scott, can you sort of explain the different levels of uh, cleanness or or, or uh, subsidy from different kinds of electric, of electric hot water heaters or different kinds of hot water heaters? Uh, I think because that, that's a, we have an elect, we have a heat pump hot water heater and it's uh, so far very pleasant to, you know, it's worked to fit well. Yeah, I mean, I think there's really uh, two categories. Um, well, maybe, maybe, I'm sorry, up to three categories. There's the the unlimited 30% credit, and I'm which are the um, home clean electricity power generation. So that's that's solar panels, fuel cells, wind turbine. For those of you who want a mini wind turbine, and battery storage. Those are 30% of cost unlimited. Geothermal um, also. Geothermal, I yes, geothermal and solar water heating as well are unlimited. And I just so you know, I'm I'm you know, I put a link in the chat to that two pager as well. Um, here, let's look at it together. Let me share this with everybody. Um, So see if I can blow it up. Can everybody see this? Yep. Yep. Yes. All right. So like I said, the, the first category is where it's unlimited. That includes solar, fuel, wind, battery storage, and geothermal and solar water heating. Like if you put a water heater at the top of your solar panel. Um, then the second category, which would be, um, we're talking home energy efficient, well, um, is $2,000 and that includes heat pumps, heat pump water heaters and, and biomass stoves. So you can get up to $2,000 per year. And what's cool is that every year you can, you can go back 
So you, let's say you, you don't want to do all the heat pumps at once. Um, so you um, you can do one a year and get two thousand back a year. Um, the the next the next category, which really is the bulk of everything else, is the thirty percent up to six hundred dollars, and um, I think that is Len. Maybe you can chime in here just to confirm this, but. That's part of the twelve hundred dollars. Like you could aggregate all the stuff that's less than two thousand. Yeah, and you get a maximum of of twelve hundred per year. So right, right. I I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, then you got the uh, you know your electrical panels, your windows, your skylights, your exterior doors. Len talked about the home energy audits. And I'm guessing if you're going to install a home energy electrical vehicle charger, you're going to have an electrical vehicle. So you're probably already aware. But you do get a deduction of up to 30 percent or three hundred dollars for a residential home. Yes, yeah, so also so count for vacation homes, too. Just so you know, for second homes. Right. Um, so what about rental property? The funny thing about rental property, it's it, it makes no sense. Only the renter can get the credit. Okay. But, so yeah. So the thirty percent of the cost up to two thousand. If you use a two thousand dollars on a heat pump, then you can't use any more. There's not a different category for the efficient air conditioner, for instance. It's two thousand period, or it's. It's it's a two thousand dollar types of things and the six hundred dollars type of things and the unconditional types of things. Are they all separate or do they combine? Len, you I knew there was a slide you were doing, Len. Each 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 is it each is its own. I'm saying the, the, the unlimited things are are unlimited and the things that are limited are limited. Uh, I, I don't you don't have to combine. I mean you're saying can you get infinite number of electric panel upgrades at $600 a pop? No, it's limited to $600. Can you then also go do windows? That the windows are limited to 600. Those two together, you're going to hit the 1200 limit. Right? Oh, per okay, year. that's right. So you could technically do like a heat pump windows and you could at the slide that we ha on the handout it was right. thirty two hundred dollars that's really like the math you have to do the specific things you can't just get thirty two hundred dollars for a bunch of windows right so right. so um i don't know are there any any other, i guess harold did you have a question yeah harold. my question uh preceded this discussion it was with regard to solar panels uh, anybody who's had experience with solar panels, I was wondering uh, additional costs, what sort of maintenance issues have uh, arisen? Uh, are they susceptible to damage from hail? Uh, does it affect your uh, yes. insurance, home insurance in any in any respect? So interested in what experience people have. Hmm. Well, so when I was doing re some I research on for us, the one, the couple of things that I was concerned about is uh, squirrels getting underneath the panels, and I think some of the panels now are so close to the roof that that's not as much the case. Is that is that correct, Marty? That is correct. Um, also, as far as durability, uh, they're supposed to be um, able to withstand incredible amounts of wind and hail. Uh, personally, I've gone through a hailstorm and nothing happened to the panels. The biggest thing is really not the weight of the panel so much as the lift um, that worried about wind getting up underneath it and lifting the panel off the roof. But again, that's uh, taken care of by most uh, good installers. They have the hail, uh, I was told when I was looking, um, if you have damage, you're not paying a month, a yearly fee, but the company that, that uh, installed it that's part of their warranty is hail damage, if there is any. Generally, uh, it's true. And um, as far as the wind thing, 
from what I saw, from they have these um, huge, uh, and each panel has these um, connections that hold them down onto the roof. Um, so it's unlikely the wind would uh, pull it pull it away. Hi, highly unlikely. So I don't. There's have... no maintenance. Uh, to somebody asked us maintenance. There really isn't. No. Uh, that's number one, and usually the insurance will cover uh, you. You'll include it in your homeowner's policy because there's a value if you own it. Uh, if you uh, do a PPA, a power purchase agreement, then the investor owns it, so you don't have to insure it. So I was also part of the investment group with Len at Marlboro Jewish Center, <clears throat> as well as uh, I had solar panels on my home in New Jersey for about five or six years before we sold and moved to Florida. Uh, interesting enough, as you heard from what uh, Brian shared and what Len shared, as well as my own personal experience, New Jersey of all states is incredibly generous when it came to uh, the SREC program which made it financially feasible uh, to put that investment group together. But as far as my own personal experience as a resident, uh, never had an issue with my panels. Um, you know, snow, don't recall hail, but uh, no issues there. But getting those $7 electric bills, that put a smile on my face. <laughs> and then getting, uh, getting the SREC checks also as well. But uh, uh, down here in Florida, uh, while it's not, I'm not finding discouragement per se, but there's certainly no, other than the federal credits that have been discussed, there's no real incentives here, whether it's because Florida Power and Light has a monopoly and just uh, you know, kills it in the legislature or, or what have you. Uh, you know, one would think the Sunshine State would have much more in the way of incentives, uh, but it does not. Yeah. Uh, and the last point I want to make Rich, we got to kind of call it a night. Yeah, just, just the last point I want to make is uh, for my discussions with the folks who installed the panels at Marlboro Jewish, the technology has improved dramatically over the years. It just keeps getting better and better. So whatever positives there were in the past uh, should only increase going forward. Thank Northern you. Florida is more attractive for solar than Southern. The Florida Power does have a... Uh, a monopoly, but Duke Energy, the northern part of Florida, is much more uh, uh, amenable, and and there's more more opportunity there. Well, thanks, yeah, Scott like to, and uh, Len, for leading this. It was fantastic, and I think everybody uh, got a lot out of it. Um, we really appreciate that, and hopefully, we'll have you back uh, as the year goes on. Rich, you want to comment? Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Yeah, it's a, it's a great group. It's really exciting to have all the participation and uh, all of the experience that we're bringing to this. And uh, if uh, if you'd like to send us notes, we we will we'll pass things on as well to help each other out. Uh, but there's a this is a it's you're right on the on the edge of technology. It seems like it's we we've all had enough had experiences that it can be done. With good reliability, but and I think uh, we all have to be aware that there's going to be some changes in your lifestyle as a result of of all of this. And uh, you know, we hopefully us men's clubbers are used to change, and I like to be on the leading edge of things. So that's great. Hey, Rich, can right. I ask you a question? Rich, can I ask a question? When's yep. the next yep. time you guys are going to have another meeting like this? What? Uh, what? More on the finance or the environment? Yeah, side? yeah, everything that you're talking about, finance and the situations like what you're talking about now. Well, I one other thing, I just I know we're we're over the the nine o'clock hour, and I'm you know if you I know uh, if you want to spend a few more minutes, the last thing I just if you have ideas, anybody for topics that you're interested in, you know, I'm. That's part of what I wanted to learn too. So we could bring topics that environmental topics that people want to know more about. The actually the this, to me the single best way of learning about this stuff is is researching comp stock companies that have you know stocks that's uh, that have stocks and 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 researching the stocks of companies that sell this is a wonderful way of understanding all about it. So that might be a possibility. 
Joseph, where where are you in this game? I live I live in Massachusetts. Yeah, us too. And I mean, are you uh, thinking about doing something? Have you done something? Uh, no, I. A lot of people come by and try to convince me to put the panels on my roof, but I'm 81 years old. So, you know, my chances of living here another 10 years is going to be limited, so I didn't want to make the investment. <laughs> Think of the impact you can make. Well, I know, but you know what? I was just more interested in learning about different ways of investment, and that's why I asked the question, do you have a series? Is it every month, every other month? Sometimes I catch you guys, and sometimes I don't, so that's why... So, so a creative way for you would be to a creative way for you would be to um, instead of giving your kids money, buy a solar system for them. <laughs> I love it for their houses. Don't forget, right. If I may add one last comment, the whole idea of this thing is to mitigate our wonderful fossil fuel expansion in this particular Iraq, which you have not talked about, is methane gas. Oh, I can talk forever on the that. The worst thing we have right now. And the president in his IRA Act definitely has a methane provision. And the idea here is to basically energize with clean energy using electric concepts. So you want to look into rewiring act, which is another area which co coincides with IRA. And we'll explain how some of these items work together. Yeah. However, 30% of all methane invest. gas is produced by us throwing away tables of scraps from our table. So think about composting. <laughs> so, so Scott, is is that is the rewire act in the rewire uh, area something that you guys could uh, bring to bring us more There's information on? Do with that for you. I can give you information on it. I have a good handout. I could send it to you. Richard Maybe and I we were, get a, were a group together to continue these. Uh, I think it's very interesting and important to understand the the reasons behind this legislation and this these subsidies and to to uh, I, I think we can have one of our challenges is to motivate Joseph to wanting to do this. No, I'll <laughs> have to move into a condo. My family is pushing me for a condo. I'm Richard and I were involved in this potential investment in New York where they had 800,000 square feet of, of um, a greenhouse and they were producing vegetables, but they found, uh, found a way to take all the methane gas from the cattle in New York and convert it into energy to run, run this place. Remember that, Rich? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's neat. That's pretty cool. So there's there's a lot of topics we can talk about. So it looks like there's the interest. So maybe Richard and I will kind of look into this a little bit more. But Scott okay, and Len, great. thanks thank so you. much. You really stimulated a great yeah, conversation. Thank you, guys. Thank you. You're welcome.